welcome to Vet Talk, the veterinary podcast. I'm Dr. Nathan. Thanks for listening. This is an informational podcast, and we hope you find it a valuable tool to help you understand veterinary medicine and how to better care for your animals. If you want to contact us, please reach out to theveterinarypodcast at gmail.com. You can find a complete list of the podcast episodes on SoundCloud or by going to lickingvalleyvet.com and finding the education page. While you are there, take a look at our blog section for more helpful information. You can also follow Licking Valley Veterinary Hospital's Facebook page if you want regular updates on released podcasts, blogs, and videos. If you find this information helpful, please feel free to make a donation to the continuation of this content. There is a link to do this on the webpage under the podcast list. As always, thanks for listening, and I hope this information is helpful to you. So, this is our first in the field interview. Um, I want to make a little note first. Uh, I want to apologize that the sound quality is a little bit off. Uh, we will get it better in future episodes. Uh, but again, thank you for the people we interviewed. Um, I did not want to uh, miss out on this lovely interview and the uh, information we got from it. So, better audio in the future. Bear with us, and I think this will be a good episode, and you'll learn a lot. Today, we're finally out in the field. I'm excited to be out and about, and I'm excited that our first guest is a good client of mine, Amy Venario at Fox Run Environmental Education Center. Hi, glad to have you here. Since we're out here, what is here? Fox Run Environmental Education, and if you put the C on it, and it's Fox Run Environmental Education Center, and it's freak. So it fits me really well. Well, we all have a little freak in us if we are working with animals. Uh, But how did you get started? Fox Run started out as a for-profit business. It started out as a certified organic uh, produce farm. And I started doing education programs Um, On the farm, people um, had questions, and I started doing some classes about gardening, and then, uh, so I have lived off-grid for uh, over 25 years now, and people started asking me about the the cabin I had built living off-grid, and um, so I started teaching classes, and one of the things one of the jobs I had had was I had worked for uh, the National Wildlife Federation education programs, and that was something that was very near and dear to my heart, uh, was wildlife conservation. And so um, when my children got older and um, when my youngest was in high school, I kind of decided, well, you know, it was time for me to do something for me changed from being a for-profit to a non-profit. It seems like you do more than just for you, because there's a lot of critters running around here. As a wildlife rehabilitator, and that is a big part now of Fox Run. So there are a lot of critters running around here. We teach classes and things on wildlife, but then we take in wildlife that has been injured or orphaned and uh, work to rehabilitate them so that they can be re-released into the wild. So we just got a little tour here, but could you tell everyone what animals you rehabilitate here? Ah, well, so when we're recording this, it is fall, and two species have fall litters, and that's opossums and squirrels. And so I have several, um, baby squirrels and baby opossums that were fall babies, but in general, we do raccoons, foxes, squirrels, possums, skunks, and I'm also, so I'm licensed for mammals and reptiles, and so I also then do turtles, and occasionally um, I get in a snake, and so... uh, 
we are not licensed for birds. Birds are a federal um, regulation. So there's a lot of regulations to become a wildlife rehabilitator, and and I noticed you have fawns here too. So it, it's not just all the different regulations, but you've got a lot of different species to care for and have to know about each and every one of them, right? You need to know about each individual species because every species of wild animal needs a little bit of different care. And how hard the animal is um, sometimes depends on how they come in. So you know that I often get deer that are broken. So, you know, unfortunately deer will come in with broken legs and, um, you know, we've had fawns where you have um, set broken legs or you have amputated um, you know, portion of the leg uh, because they've been by a car. So you're doing a lot of medical care as well as basic husbandry. Right. So one of the things in the state of Kentucky, and I believe um, it's true in most states, is that you have to have a veterinarian um, that is willing to work with you. So we're very glad we have you because not all veterinarians um, are is... open to wildlife. So... Um, we work closely with Dr. Laza and so it's important when you're doing wildlife rehabilitation to have a veterinarian that will work um, with you. Uh, wild species, you know, in some ways have very similar problems to domestic animals, but they also have a lot of uh, unique um, issues that are all their own. And wild animals uh, don't as readily adapt, uh, you know, to you giving them medical care. And we can often, you know, send a wild animal into shock if we're not careful, you know, in our treatment of it. So even with as much training as all of us have, we still have to make some stuff up. Um, and it's, it's better to have more training than less training. Right, right. It's been a humongous learning curve. So yeah, I don't have a lot of books on um, a lot of these animals and, you know, they just aren't as as published in the literature as dogs and cats. And I got some basic training in vet school, but, you know, I've been learning as I go a lot. Um, and I can treat a lot of the medical things, but I rely on the wildlife rehabilitator for a lot of things too and, and their judgment. Um, so it's really a working relationship going back and forth. I, I can't do it without an educated wildlife rehabilitator who knows what's going on and can help me with some of the species specifics where, uh, you know, I know a lot of the medical specifics. It does. It has to be a working relationship and you have to um, have good communication uh, yeah. between oh. the rehabber and the, and the veterinarian. One of the other things that uh, wildlife rehabilitators in different states have conferences and education programs. So I've been to several conferences and, and education classes and, and I can bring back information and share it with you and um, you know we can kind of decide if that's something that we want to implement. Uh, and we both use the internet for information but is the internet a great place to get information from? Well the internet in general is very as far as quality of information. I have a number of people that call me and they call and they, you know, say that they have found an animal three days ago and they've been giving it, you know, baby formula because that's what they read on the internet. And so at that point I'm cringing because uh, the internet does have a lot of misinformation. So we tell people, you know, never feed a baby animal. What happens when an animal is orphaned is it starts to dehydrate because it doesn't have a mother taking care of it. So it doesn't have um, a mother feeding it or cleaning it. And that animal becomes that baby animal becomes dehydrated it's typically covered in you know fleas and lice and so you know it, it if we were to give that animal formula which is a food even though formula is a liquid it's not a fluid it's a food 
we can send that baby's body into distress because it's sending all its reserves then into the intestinal tract and it can actually die um, from being, you know, fed formula. So unfortunately, I do get a lot of baby animals that, you know, have kind of been uh, mishandled, not because the person wasn't caring or not because the person wasn't trying, uh, but because, you know, they went on the internet and, um, you know, some Yahoo was like, yeah, sure, feed them this. So, so yeah, I, I, I know some wildlife rehabilitators, I'm using air quotes here, um, and, and I just, I feel like they have an internet and education only, and I can't trust them to do some of the things that a licensed, educated wildlife rehabilitator can, can know. And I don't really blame them. We're all, all learning about this, but there's certain things I need you to know um, as a wildlife rehabilitator so you can take care of some of those things like you just discussed um, and things like that. So, uh, again, that's what the licensing is for. And, and that's why I want to work with a wildlife rehabilitator. I used to take more animals in from people who were uh, just being a good Samaritan, but I find that the aftercare, uh, we're, we're losing more animals than we should. So a lot of times I just now say, hey, go to the wildlife rehabilitator, um, surrender the animal to them, and then give them a donation so they can so they can do this with the vet and their training and expertise. Uh, so that's one reason I try to work with a wildlife rescue so I know that the right care is being given because I can't be there for every little, you know, every little thing and stuff. So how many hours a day do you put in? Because we're not at your highest point of the season, but you still have a fair number of animals right now. How many hours a day are you putting in now and, and maybe in the spring? take care of these things? Uh, well, spring is definitely my busiest time, but uh, typically I am in the barn that holds the wildlife rescue. I'm out in the barn at 5 a.m. and I come back down to my house between 7 and 8 p.m. And so... So, so you have a lot of free time? <laughs> I have no free time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're doing all this and staying up on everything to make sure you're caring for every, uh, all the animals properly. Um, and you have to, it's, you mentioned some uh, laws before, you're accredited too, right? Or your license, I should say. Right. So in the state of Kentucky, we apply, you have to apply and pay for a permit with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And they are the uh, government agency that oversees us. In other states, so just across the river, the wildlife rehabilitators in Ohio are governed by the Department of Natural Resources. So it does vary a little bit um, state to state. Birds are actually governed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So that's a federal regulation thing, and, and there's a lot of oversight to this all around. Yes, you have to, you know, fill out a application and, and different states have different requirements on what you need to do as far as education and um, some states are stricter on certain animals so in Kentucky with my mammal license I can do um, any mammal that's a native animal uh, with the exception um, of bears or cougars which are technically um, not a native species anymore. The cougar um, sightings or the cougars that we have in the state have um, are escaped captive animals. Uh, they that, are not sad, breeding. Yes, cougars. I know. Um, and there are a couple yeah. of centers that have a USDA permit for, um, for cougars. Um, and your education animals? That's a USDA yeah. Um, thing. So I do have education animals, and education animals are those animals that um, have an injury or an illness, and uh, the government does regulate, you know, what... So your education animals are the ones that 
I see more because um, they can't function in the wild because of their medical injury. So you keep them to educate people. Right. If, if they're not able to, you know, find their own food, whatever food that may be. Um, and so I do education programs. We haven't done very many this year because of the pandemic. Um, but typically, uh, we go to schools and we, uh, you know, take turtles and uh, I've taken opossums, um, snakes, turtles, uh, and I've talked about different animals. Um, I also have scouts that come here. We went and visited the um, fox turtle enclosure, and that was made for us. It was built by a Girl Scout troop. Jesse Zink's Girl Scout troop in Taylor Mill, um, Kentucky. They're fabulous, and I've, I've been really impressed by Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts actually have a number of um, science and nature um, activities, and these girls built that enclosure, and they earned um, a community service uh, award for that. So you've done a lot of stuff and are doing a lot of stuff all the time with this. Is this something, wildlife rescue, that everyone should go into? Um, definitely not. Um, you definitely need to, um, you know, give it a lot of thought because it is very time consuming. It's actually um, also very financially consuming. Um, so I personally have spent many, many thousands of my own dollars doing this. The vet is so, but there's a lot of, there are a lot of expenses. Um, you know, there's formula to buy and they need housing. Um, you know, the housing needs to be an appropriate size. Yeah, you've got like some book from the um, government that the housing has to be certain measurements. Yeah, yeah. There's so many things to consider because you have to, you know, make sure your deer pen is not where your dogs walk past every day because you don't want a predator scaring um, something you're trying to rehabilitate. Right, right. And it, well, it's very stressful. And so you, you know, you don't want to have wildlife in your home because, you know, your personal animals, especially dogs, are going to frighten that. So if you have a, you know, fawns um, or rabbits, both of which are prey animals, um, they are just naturally going to be afraid of your dogs and that's going to cause them stress. So, um, you know, one of the things that we have is we have a separate building, you know, for a wildlife. And yeah, so. so, and then, you know, when we talk about enclosures, I basically do a three-step system. So we have a small enclosure when they're an infant. They don't, you know, they're not moving around too much. They don't need so much space. And they can have a smaller. And then they go to a grow-out cage, which is a little bit bigger. And they're moving around more. And we give them, you know, activities and toys and things so they can climb and, you know, build up their muscles. And then they go out to, a, you know, an outdoor enclosure or a kennel so that they can, you know, adapt to all the sounds and the, um, you know, all the sensory information that's outside because the next step is, um, you know, releasing them. And so we want them to be, you know, comfortable. And, right? and you don't want them to be tame with dogs or people either. Right, because, because then they're going to get killed. Yeah, because they'll walk right out so, to something that may not be nice to them. So. Right. And so if they're comfortable with, you know, um, animals, uh, you know, uh, that inappropriately, um, you know, if a, if a fawn goes up to a, a dog or something, that dog might think, oh, well, you're, you know, dinner. you're dinner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, or, I mean, you know, for that matter, we don't want the fawns to uh, be, you know, running around and um, going up to a human. Yeah. So, uh, well, the problem is, is when they're young and cute, they're, you know, young and cute and they enjoy having a snack. But, you know, when a buck is 400 pounds and he has a big rack and, 
he expects you to hand him a treat, you know, he can be quite dangerous. And the fish and wildlife officers have to go into suburban areas, you know, and, and basically, you know, catch and then they kill, you know, those animals because they're habituated. So there's a lot to think about before going into wildlife rehabilitation because it's all not just making, you know, Bambi better and putting them out in the wild because we have to think of our impact on humans and then our impact on on the rehabilitators. Uh, It's not always easy stuff that you're dealing with. Right, it's just something you need to think about. And the other thing I do point out to people when I talk to people who are interested in becoming rehabbers is... You know, you do have to say no. You have to know that you have to set limits because to provide the best care for that animal, it needs to have your time and your energy and and your resources. If you take, you know, every animal that you get a call on and you have too many animals, then, you know, your time, energy, and resources are very stressed. And then, you know, you become a very depressed, you know, upset person and the animal is not getting the care that they should have. But I always do tell new rehabbers that, you know, you can say no. And you can also, you know, some people just do squirrels. Some people just do raccoons. You can just, you know, limit yourself to what they're good at. Right. And do you get bitten? (laughs) Many times every year. (laughs) I, I do get, uh, I've, I've been bitten quite a bit and um, scratched, and uh, I've, um, I've listened to your lectures on how I need to be more careful because uh, we do have zoonotic diseases also. So, and, and thankfully you've kept me from being bitten by these That's smart, right, know. I'm the human shield. Exactly. Good job. Yeah. So flipping back a bit to our earlier conversation points, Education seems a big part of what you do. Why is education so important? Uh, Because I'm a teacher, and I did teach professionally in in both public and private schools, as well as um, in my younger years, I was a teacher at the Museum of Natural History. So that is just something that's really important to me. Um, You know, I enjoy sharing my love for animals. I enjoy sharing my love of gardening. And I'm also pretty passionate about um, helping people um, live, you know, more environmentally friendly lives. So one of our focuses is helping people um, to be more environmentally friendly and um, to find, you know, it, it might be a just a small thing, um, but to find those small things that they can do in their life that help the environment, uh, that help, you know, wildlife. Uh, you know, one of the things that we teach about uh, is, you know, having a wildlife friendly um, yard, or if you're on a farm, having a section of your farm that's a wildlife friendly. And so, so yeah, a lot of people are probably saying, why, why are we, why are we doing this? Why are we starting with these little animals? I mean, I think a lot of people understand wanting to save the polar bears. Um, but you know, why are we starting with, um, saving the raccoons and, and saving deer? Uh, you know, I think every driver in Kentucky is like, well, there's enough deer out there because we see them on the roads all the time. So, so what's our goal here? What are we trying to accomplish? Well, all animals have a place in the ecosystem, and all animals are important. And for those of your listeners that are Christians, I like to tell people that, you know, God made the animals on day five. People were not made to day six. And so, um, you know, there... We all are very important. Um, And one of the things, one of the reasons that we have overpopulation of some of these animals is because we've killed the predators. So we of humans have kind of thrown a wrench in the wheel. You know, the wheel worked very, very well. And the environment worked very, very well. Wildlife. 
life rehabbers kind of feel like we're helping with putting things back in balance. So you're doing a lot of education and care for, for the little creatures at the, the base of a pyramid so that, um, you know, the apex predators, your things at the top of the pyramid, which you don't have as many of, but uh, kind of get more publicity, your lions, your tigers, your bears, so they have stuff that um, uh, can fit in the wheel, as you were saying, to support them, or so they can get support. Um, and when you go out to schools, that's, that's teaching people the balance of things and stuff. So I, I think that's very important. Um, and I think we just need to understand that better in our lives. Well, I think one of the broader pictures is that we're very disconnected with nature. We're very disconnected with wildlife. We are, um, you know, inside and, and we don't interact with, you know, nature. We don't interact with wild animals, um, you know, not meaning that we should go out and try to physically interact with them, but, um, you know, people don't get outside and hike. Children aren't as out, outside as often just, you know, playing and adventuring and, you know, playing in the creek. And so when we take animals to schools, it gives those children an experience that they often haven't had, especially when I go into, you know, into urban uh, schools and so they might you know not have that connection and you know sometimes you know what I think is you know a really easy you know what is this animal um you know the kids don't necessarily know well yeah I've had people ask me is that a horse you know when <laughs> I've, I've been at various events so just the basic knowledge helps people understand right the world around us and you know, how we affect it. And, and, and that's maybe how we can get a big, big help. Right. And I talk about, you know, what does this animal contribute to its ecosystem? What does it, you know. Yeah, because um, every animal plays a part. Right. And you need raccoons just as much as you need, um, you know, polar bears. Maybe I should choose something. <laughs> this cougars. Cougars. Cougars are in Kentucky. Right. So, yeah, I mean, everything's... Uh, children are naturally, they're naturally curious, they're naturally, you know, friendly. And so, you know, if you give them a reason, you know, they're going to, you know, gain love and appreciation. Um, do, do, I mean, you've gone pretty extreme off the grid. I don't, I don't think I could <laughs> live like this. Yeah, I don't think I could live like this for more than a weekend or so. So does everyone need to do this? No, everybody can find things that they can do in their own life. I just happen to feel very, very strongly that, you know, it's my place to be part of the environment and to really, um, you know, live my life very focused on being environmentally friendly and, you know, part of the natural world. So, um you know, I'm happy living the way I'm living, but no, not everybody could could live like but we could all <laughs> I'm living because living in my house is like a permanent, permanently camping. <laughs> but we could all reevaluate how we're living. I mean, simple things like you know, evaluating you know how much gas and what your carbon footprint is. Um, there are many uh, sites on the internet that where you can plug in some information and it'll tell you what your carbon footprint is and what kinds of um, activities that you can do. Um, you know, maybe driving less or consolidating trips, um, recycling, composting. You know, we, we waste a lot of things. So just reducing, you know, the amount of things we waste and um, working to make um, less waste and even even simple things like um, putting in a raised bed and planting flowers so that local pollinators, bees and um, you know bumblebees and butterflies, and you're providing food for them. You know when you plant flowers, flowers are beautiful. They look nice in front of your house, 
but they're also very advantageous because they're feeding insects and, you know, insects are, are, you know, feeding bigger animals and it just goes through the food chain. So you're doing a lot of good work here. So if someone wants to help you do this good work, um, how can they reach out and contribute to you? They can help. We do uh, have a volunteer program. And we do have uh, two wish lists. So on our website, you can go to the website and there's a tab that says help us. And there are several things you can do to help us. Um, We do have a wish list. We have an Amazon wish list, um, which I try to update um, every couple of months. Uh, But there's uh, animal foods, formulas, uh, uh, nipples, um, things to care for the animals, even things like um, dog kennels, uh, which we use for outdoor enclosures. So you can get uh, something off the wish list and then Amazon sends it right here. You can also on the website um, donate. The website is set up to um, take donations. So you can donate um, whatever, you know, amount on the website. Uh, but you don't need uninvited animals as contribution, right? Yes, I, um, I've had cats thrown over my fence. I've actually had baby raccoons thrown over the fence. I'm guessing that's not how you typically intake animals. No, no, I have cameras set up now and I do report to the police because, um, you know, that's not safe for the animal, um, at all and not an appropriate way, uh. If, if people do uh, find a baby animal, the best way to get me is to text me. I am out in the country, and my phone reception is not always the best, but texting comes through, and um, and then I will, um, you know, talk to them. And if the animal does seem to need intervention, um, then uh, we'll set up a time where they can come and, and drop the animal off. And donations are appreciated. Donations are always appreciated. It doesn't matter how small or or how big. (laughs) Um, One of the other things that um, we had two uh, wonderful people, uh, Whitney Quint and Jesse Zink, this year did the Facebook birthday uh, fundraiser. And so uh, Facebook has um, a thing where for your birthday, you can pick a charity, and um, so both of those women uh, picked Fox Run, and then, you know, your friends can donate for your birthday, and so um, that was a great success, so we appreciated that. Um, we are a nonprofit. We are a 501c3, so uh, contributions are tax deductible. I know that they've changed um, a lot of the way the tax code works with nonprofits, uh, but there is, you are still able to uh, write off. So we recommend licensed rehabilitators um, uh, because there are a lot of people out there who say they are licensed rehabilitators, um, but they're not. Uh, How can you find a qualified licensed rehabilitator? So the Department of Fish and Wildlife on their website keeps a list of licensed wildlife rehabilitators. Um, we also get a identification card with a number, um, so you can, you know, ask. Um, you can also call Fish and Wildlife. Some people can opt out of being on their public list if they just want to do a few things, um, but you can always call the Department of Fish and Wildlife and ask if if the person is uh, licensed. Um, we don't... Um, encourage uh, people to rehab wildlife without a license because what happens if you get caught and I can tell you many many incidences where people get caught um, the sad thing is if they catch an illegal wildlife rehabilitator they kill the animal or animals Um, the person gets fined and you know depending on I guess the The infringement uh, can also go to jail, but the sad part is that they uh, they typically uh, destroy animals. So in that process, what has been the hardest 
part of being a wildlife rehabilitator because that, that doesn't sound fun hearing about those things. But. No, that's not fun hearing about those things. Um, uh, the hardest part is that animals die and um, I can't save them all. And um, sometimes they come in in very bad shape and may pass, but sometimes I think I, I, you know, I've had them for a week and I think, oh, we're, you know, we've gotten over, um, you know, that mountain and, and, you know, we finally stabilized or doing well and, and then the animal passes and then I'm like, why? And, uh, so, um, so it can be sad. It can be frustrating. Um, you know, uh, wildlife rehabbers, um, suffer from compassion fatigue, which is I mean, something that uh, you know, veterinarians talk about, nurses, uh, people in medical fields. Um, so, uh, so it is important, um, you know, as, as a rehabber to, um, you know, take time for yourself. I say this as I work a 16 hour day, but, um, <laughs> but it is, it can be stressful and, uh, you know, it's financially stressful and it's stressful because, you know, and it is a very immediate thing. You know, someone calls and usually that when the person calls, they're very upset because they found an animal that's injured or orphaned and, and they're frustrated. And, and sometimes they've called several people and they're calling around trying to figure out, you know, what to do because not everyone knows if you find a baby wild um, animal in the state of Kentucky, as I said, that list of rehabbers is on the Fish and Wildlife website. There's also a national organization called Animal Help Now, and it's animalhelpnow.org. And they have um, an app, and you just plug in your um, location, and it gives you licensed rehabbers um you know, in whatever location you are in the United States. So that's also available. So one of my personal goals in life is to help my clients see how they fit in the world around them, to realize the effects we have on the world and what effects the worlds have on us. Uh, you know, when we throw away our trash, it goes somewhere. When we treat our animals with chemicals, those chemicals have effects on the body and the environment. We have to weigh the pros and cons of these effects. For example, I think dewormers are relevant to have fatter cows and less parasites in our food, but that doesn't mean we should overuse them and have high concentrations of dewormers in the ground and food supply. It's all about balance and Fox Run Environmental Education is one of the many rescues and education organizations out there that are, are helping people understand, you know, how we all fit into this. And I bet there are some in your local community as well. So reach out, support them, get to know them, and see how you can help those organizations and let, let them educate you so you can understand how you fit in with the world and the effects around it and how we affect it. And I think that's going to help us all when we know just a little bit more and, you know, we'll get a, get a better world because of it. I'm not talking too much. This is what the people, they want. They want my random musings. So for my final thought, I just want people to stop and, you know, think about the importance of that wildlife plays in the natural world, in the environment, um, you know, we don't often talk about, uh, you know, all the benefits, but there are a lot of benefits that wildlife um, provides for us. And, you know, they are, you know, very much um, a deserving part uh, of the environment. So, um, you know, instead of looking at a coyote and thinking, um, oh, he's a predator, I don't want him around, I don't want, uh, you know, the coyote near my children or near my um, cats, you know, think about the coyote's place in the world and, um, you know, the benefit that uh, they provide uh, to the ecosystem. And so, you know, one thing that they do is they eat a lot of, uh, you know, mice and in the urban areas, uh, 
studies have shown that they eat a lot of rats. And so, um, you know, they are helping then to protect all of us from, you know, diseases. So, like pandemics, um, like, like pandemics, plague. like the bubonic plague. Yes. And so, so, um, you know, all of, all of the animals um, are very important. Um, opossums eat thousands of ticks. And so, you know, they um, are an important part of their uh, ecosystems. So, you know, and if we didn't have vultures eating all the carrion that was killed on the side of the road, you know, the sides of the roads would be very stinky and very, you know, full of decayed material. So those birds you know, have a very important uh, role. But we need them so, more than they need us themselves. Um, yes, definitely. We definitely need them more than they need us. So, so you can oh. find us at um, www.foxrunenvironmentaleducationcenter.org. We are also on Facebook and Pinterest at Fox Run Environmental Education Center and on Twitter at Fox Run EEC. So we would be very happy if you followed us. Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Nathan. I hope this information was helpful to you and gives you a little more perspective on the world. If you want to reach out to us, email us at theveterinarypodcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to tell your friends about our podcast and check out lickingvalleyvet.com for information on blogs, videos, and the complete list of podcasts in our education section.